Eight students, guided by a professor, bravely left their mentor to start a company based on their collective research. Their aim was not to undermine their professor, but to pursue their dream of independence and innovation. But unbeknownst to them, this step would become foundational for Silicon Valley and the modern tech industry, as they were key in commercializing semiconductor technology, influencing today's gadgets. These pioneers, later known as the traitorous eight played a crucial though lesser known role in the emergence of silicon valley and the current tech era but before we go any further welcome to tales of titans the place where business and history come to life so without further ado let's dive into the story of the traitorous eight going back to a chilly winter in the mid 1950s there was a man named william shockley a brilliant mind who had a hand in inventing the transistor and, at that time, he was gracing Stanford University with his presence as a visiting professor. But Shockley was restless. He had bigger dreams. He envisioned creating his own empire of advanced transistors and Shockley diodes. Initially, Shockley partnered with Raytheon, a big name in the industry, but the collaboration was short-lived and within a month, Raytheon pulled the plug on the project. Undeterred, Shockley sought the counsel of Arnold Beckman, a well-known financier and owner of Beckman Instruments. Shockley's vision was grand, needing a whopping $1 million to come to life, which is an amount equivalent to about $11 million in today's currency. Now, Beckman, a shrewd businessman, recognized Shockley's potential, and he knew Shockley might struggle in the business world, but his innovations could be a goldmine for Beckman Instruments. Determined not to let these ideas fall into competitors' hands, Beckman agreed to back Shockley's venture. The catch? The lab's discoveries had to be ready for mass production within two years. Thus, Shockley Semiconductor Laboratories was born as a division of Beckman Instruments. The deal was inked in 1955, and they secured all necessary patents for $25,000, a considerable sum back then. The lab found its home in Mountain View near Palo Alto, California, a location that would later become the heart of technological innovation, aka Silicon Valley. Everybody knew Shockley was a magnet for talent, and he managed to bring in four PhD physicists from prestigious backgrounds. But the lab's location was less appealing to potential recruits. Most semiconductor experts were on the East Coast. So, in a bold move, Shockley advertised in the New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune, and this campaign turned into a resounding success, drawing responses from hundreds, including future tech luminaries like Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore. The selection process was rigorous throughout 1956. Shockley, a believer in social technologies, subjected each candidate to psychological tests and personal interviews. And by September, the lab was bustling with 32 employees, including Shockley himself. Now among these employees, eight members would later become known as the Traitorous Eight. These included Julius Blank, Victor Greenwich, Jean Hornet, Eugene Kleiner, Jay Last, Gordon Moore, Robert Noyce, and Sheldon Roberts. The members were aged between 26 and 33, and six of them held PhDs. Hornier was an experienced scientist and gifted manager, and according to Bo Lojek, matched Shockley in intellect. Only Noyce was involved in semiconductor research, and only Greenwich had experience in electronics. Now, in this laboratory, our team of scientists, including Yorne and Noyce, worked tirelessly for a year on various projects. But Shockley had a unique approach, allowing his team to manage technological tasks without additional technical staff. Shockley's focus was on the Shockley diode, aiming for mass production, while some of his team, led by Noyce, worked on a field effect transistor for Beckman Instruments. Notably, Shockley chose not to pursue bipolar transistors, a decision later viewed as a significant mistake, and the effort invested in the Shockley diodes ultimately didn't pay off commercially. The story gets more complex as we learn from sources like Noyce, Moore, and others that initially, Shockley planned to mass produce diffusion bipolar transistors but suddenly shifted to a secretive project on Shockley diodes, halting all work on bipolar transistors in 1957. The reason for this pivot remains unclear, but Shockley seemed more driven by scientific curiosity than commercial potential, 
as noted by Beckman's biographer. Now, Bo Lojek, with access to Shockley's archives, presents a different view. He argues that Shockley Labs was always focused on Shockley diodes, partly due to military R&D contracts from Beckman Instruments, and speculates that these diodes could have revolutionized telephony if they had been more reliable. But hey, you have to understand that from the very beginning, Shockley was a unique character. Even as a child, he had a fiery temper, often exploding into fits of aggression without any apparent reason. This side of him was somewhat kept in check by the strict discipline of his professional environment, but it was always there, simmering beneath the surface. And it didn't help that he saw competition everywhere even among his own team members. In 1956, a significant event happened. Shockley, along with his colleagues Bardeen and Bretagne, was awarded the prestigious Nobel Prize in Physics. This should have been a joyous occasion, but it came with its own set of challenges. The flurry of public events and celebrations that followed drained Shockley and pulled him away from his laboratory, which was already struggling with management issues. Despite the external glitter and glory, the mood inside his lab was anything but celebratory. Now, Shockley was a complex man. Though he was never formally diagnosed by psychiatrists, historians later described his behavior during 1956 and 1957 as being indicative of paranoia or even autism. His actions certainly lent credence to this view. He recorded all phone calls in the lab and, in an unusual move, forbade his staff from sharing their research findings with one another, a rule that was hardly practical given they all worked in close quarters. Trust was a rare commodity for Shockley. He even sent his employees' reports to Bell Labs for verification and, at one point, he demanded his entire team undergo a lie detector test a request they unanimously refused. Hence, the situation in the lab started deteriorating, and the first to leave was Jones, a technologist who departed in early 1957 after a fallout with two other colleagues. This exit set off a chain reaction. The team became divided, with Moore leading those who were disconcerted and Noyce aligning himself with Shockley, attempting to mediate and resolve the growing tensions. Then, in March 1957, Kleiner, supported by several colleagues, secretly sought investors in New York to start a new company, despite working at Shockley Labs. Arthur Rock and Alfred Coyle of Hayden Stone & Company showed interest. Facing internal issues at Shockley Labs, a group led by Moore gave Arnold Beckman an ultimatum to resolve the Shockley problem which Beckman initially ignored, later regretting it. Eventually, Beckman appointed a manager over Shockley, but it was too late. Seven key employees, later joined by Noyce, decided to leave and form a new company. However, finding investors was challenging. They eventually partnered with Sherman Fairchild, forming Fairchild Semiconductor with an initial capital divided among the members and investors. And by September 1957, the key members resigned from Shockley Labs, becoming known as the Traitorous Eight. Shockley, unable to understand their defection, continued to track their work and filed patents based on their ideas. Despite later successes, Shockley Labs declined and was eventually sold, while Shockley returned to academia. Meanwhile, Fairchild Semiconductor played a pivotal role in the development of Silicon Valley. Now, with them unified, the Traitorous Eight focused on commercializing silicon wafers, building on the foundation laid by Bell Labs and Shockley. They didn't just replicate existing technology, they actively improved it. Each of the eight pioneers led different methods of innovation, with Gordon Moore's approach providing most successful. By the way, this is the same Gordon Moore famous for Moore's Law. So Fairchild Semiconductor quickly integrated Moore's advancements into Shockley's research, leading to mass production of silicon wafers and dominating the semiconductor market in the early 1960s. However, Fairchild's success didn't last. Sherman Fairchild's greed played a role in its downfall. As a funding condition, Fairchild could buy out partners at any time, and this condition was intended to remove bad actors. But ultimately, Fairchild began buying out partners unnecessarily, 
thinking the company's lead was secure and no longer needed the original team's expertise. This was a major miscalculation. In the fast-evolving semiconductor industry, even a brief pause could result in losing the lead. So, as Fairchild bought out the original team, they gradually left, and by the end of the 1960s, all had departed. This marked the beginning of Fairchild's decline, although the traitorous eight continued to influence the industry significantly. Now, two prominent members of the traitorous eight were Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, who in 1968 founded Intel. Interestingly, their major competitor, AMD, was also established by former Fairchild employees, including Jerry Sanders and seven others, forming another group like the traitorous eight. But it wasn't just Intel and AMD that emerged from this group. Another tech company, Amelco, was founded by four of the original eight, Jay Last, Jean Hornet, Eugene Kleiner, and Sheldon Roberts, which later became the $20 billion worth Teledyne. Apart from these, Eugene Kleiner started a venture capital firm, aiding in the creation of companies like Compaq, Intuit, Netscape, Sun Microsystems, and Amazon. Victor Greenwich, another member, became a Stanford professor and authored a pivotal textbook on integrated circuits. Julius Blank, considered the least accomplished among them, still made significant contributions as a consultant for startups. Meanwhile, William Shockley, their former leader at Fairchild, failed to understand why the eight left. He ended up as a Stanford professor, but didn't achieve the same level of success. Despite his controversial views, Shockley's role in the birth of Silicon Valley, stemming from his 1950s lab, is undeniable. And that's the story of the traitorous eight. Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more amazing content. And as always, I'll see you in the next one. Peace!